It's 7 a.m. I leave my apartment on foot, carrying a Trader Joe's bag full of paint and other supplies. When I get to the electrical box, I start applying broad strokes of blue and yellow and purple, stepping back every once in a while to see how things are coming along and asking myself, what are people gonna think when they see what I've done? Now to be clear, I'm not a graffiti artist and this wasn't an act of vandalism. This past summer, I and 17 other artists were chosen to create murals on electrical boxes in our neighborhood, Trolley Square. It was part of a very intentional effort to make the neighborhood more beautiful. But for me, this was a really new experience because I'd never made a piece of public art before. And when I went to graduate school, I learned how to do a very academic form of oil painting on a canvas. So I'd never done this before and I never worked outdoors with people watching me. So in reflecting on my experience as a first time muralist, I've been thinking a lot about why we make public art. Why have we done it historically? And what is the role of it in a community? And because tonight we're thinking about wellness, how can it possibly contribute to the wellness of the people who live in a community? So I've selected four examples from my favorite part of the world, which is Italy. And I'm gonna use those to reflect on the question of how art makes a community better or worse. So for our first example, we're gonna to go to the year 113 AD in Rome. And this is Trajan's column. It is a victory column that shows the Roman military's victory over Dacia, which is present day Romania. And if you look at the pictures on the side of this column, they're arranged a little bit like a comic book in this kind of spiral frieze that goes all the way to the top. Emperor Trajan himself is in there 58 times and originally it was painted with all kinds of bright colors. And if you go inside, it's even possible to climb up to the top. So taken simply as a piece of artwork, it's phenomenal. It has wowed people for millennia. But before I move on to the next example, I'd like to point out that it also glorifies war and it presents the Roman victory as an unambiguous good without any space for consideration of the Romanian point of view. Zooming forward into the late Middle Ages, now we're in the 14th century and we're in a really small town, Orvieto. This is the facade of the Orvieto Duomo by Lorenzo Maiatani. And on the facade, we have pictures from the Old and New Testament. This one is Adam and Eve. And I think to really imagine what this would have been like for the people who first saw it, we have to consider that these medieval citizens did not have books at home and some of them couldn't read. And so to see pictures from the stories that were very important to them would have been a very powerful thing. It's also worth noting that without the significant role of the Catholic Church in Italy, it would not have been possible to have something this grand since it took quite a bit of money to build a church like this. And it's also a symbol of civic pride since when you back way up into the Umbrian countryside and look down on the city of Orvieto, you can see this church from a pretty long way away. All right, going about a hundred years into the future now, we're in Florence and we're looking at Luca della Robbia's ceramics for the Ospedale degli Innocenti. Here we see the rise of humanism in both the architecture and the purpose of the building. So this was the first orphanage in Europe. And if you look at Luca della Robbia's babies, they give you a little bit of a clue to how the building was used. If you had a child who you couldn't care for, there was a little hatch in the door and you could put your baby in the hatch and someone would take care of it, of them. And they would also get an education. So we see here a value for human life and for human intelligence, human education. 
But interestingly, these little babies, their symbolism lives on because if you look at the insignia for the American Academy of Pediatrics, it's actually based on one of these little babies by Luca Della Robbia. Fourth example. Now we're in the 1930s and we're back in Rome. This is Foro Italico. At the time, it would have been called Foro Mussolini. And this is the site of Luigi Montanarini's mural, Apotheosis of Fascism. And I really would show you what this mural looked like, but I don't have a Creative Commons license for it. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it looks like. Um, if you were to go into one of these buildings, what you would see is this giant mural. And in the center is Mussolini himself. And around him are all these different people from different walks of Italian society. And he's shown to be uniting them. So it's a very nationalistic piece of art. It also has a lot of the colors of Italy, red and green and white. And off on one side, there are two nude figures, one which is symbolic of communism, the other of fascism. And fascism is shown to be crushing communism. So clearly, it was meant to stir up fervor for uh, World War II. But what you might imagine is that a piece of art like this was destroyed after World War II, and that's actually not true. So unlike a lot of the art in Germany, which is gone now um, because it was destroyed, this was just covered by the Allies in the 40s, and then in the 90s it was uncovered. So it's visible there today. and. And for example, when the Italians made a bid to host the 2024 Olympics, this mural with Mussolini in it was in the background for the press conference. So I've talked about four examples, and I'm sure all of us are having different kinds of reactions to them. We might be repelled by them, curious by, about them. Maybe some of us are about to book a ticket to Italy this summer to see some of them. Um, but, I wanna, but I wanna point out about all four examples is that unlike the art we see in a museum, which we choose to see, which we pay to see, and which we probably see pretty infrequently, these pieces are in public spaces. And so people's lives have played out in their presence, in some cases for millennia. People have cried and laughed. People have seen them on days when they were hungry or tired or shouting or excited all kinds of human emotions have played out in the presence of these pieces. And I think when we see a piece of art like this every day, it's a little bit like what happens when you go to the grocery store and you're trying to choose a flavor of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And somewhere overhead, you can hear a little bit of music being piped into the store, but you're not listening to it because you're just trying to choose your ice cream. And yet somehow later, when you're on your way home or maybe just a little bit later on in the day, you notice that the lyrics are stuck in your head. And so while you may not have been paying attention to the music, because it was there and because you've probably heard it many, many times, eventually whatever the music was saying just becomes a part of the fabric of society. It becomes an idea that's very normal to you and to the other people you live with. And so knowing that a piece of art becomes a part of the way people think in a community, one question we could ask about all four of those examples is which one would you want in your community? And for me, when I heard about the Trolley Squares mural project, this question was personal because I started thinking, well, if we're going to have murals in my neighborhood, I'll see them every day. So in preparing a proposal, I was thinking not just about what I wanted to paint, but also about what I wanted to see in my neighborhood. And my process of putting together a proposal started with some watercolor paintings that were already a part of my creative practice. And to understand these weekly watercolors, you need to understand a little bit about me. So I've only been living in Wilmington for about a year. I moved here from rural New Hampshire th about this time last year. And when I first got here, I was pretty homesick and I was just thinking about ways to feel at home again. So I started this practice of doing a watercolor of something in my neighborhood, whether it was Brandywine Park, 
or something else in Wilmington. Um, some of these are from a little further away in Philadelphia, but they were all about me starting to feel at home again. And for my mural proposal, I used Photoshop to merge them together in this kind of surrealistic montage. And then I also added some people because one of the things that I'm coming to appreciate about my new community is that Brandywine Park and Trolley Square are very social spaces. Unlike rural New Hampshire, where maybe I'd go for a jog in the woods and not see anybody, now I walk out of my apartment and there's always people. So I put together my proposal, and you already know I was picked. Um, but you know, part of what was fun was not just getting chosen, but getting to make the mural. Because when I was out there working, so many people stopped to see what I was doing and to ask how it was coming along. And some people, bought me pizza or iced tea or water. And on one hand, I kind of like to think that maybe in the second century AD, there were people stopping by these Roman stonemasons and giving them a little glass of wine or some other snack. But actually, I think this probably says something about Wilmington and Trolley Square, that people wanted to support me and that people wanted to be so friendly. So I am going to show you what the finished mural looked like. But before I get to that, I want to go back to Italy a little bit because what I didn't tell you earlier was that I actually did have the opportunity to live for short periods of time in two of the cities that I mentioned. And so this question of what does it feel like to live with art, I kind of know. I didn't look at Luca della Robbia's babies or at the facade of the Orvieto Cathedral every time I walked by them. But when I lived in Florence and when I lived in Italy, I did feel a little bit of the grand narratives of humanism and Christianity echoing through the streets. And I also, when I would go to visit Rome from time to time, would sometimes feel a little bit of the shadows of fascism and imperialism around certain corners. I assume we would all agree that the Colosseum is a fantastic experience. It's huge, it's historically significant, but it's also important to remember that it's a place where in the past, enslaved men working as gladiators sometimes fought to the death. So if we're not going to tear down every problematic piece of architecture, every mural that darken, harkens to a dark period in our world's history, and in every monument that glorifies war, we have to ask ourselves what we're going to do with the sad leftovers of these dark periods. And I actually have a little answer to that. And my answer is possibly the answer is, new, is more art. So I'll tell you about my final example of public art from Italy. And this is a contemporary piece of art. It is from Bolzano in the north. And this was built in the 1930s. And like a lot of the buildings from that era, it does have a fascist mural on its side. There's a picture of Mussolini in that picture. But what's unique about this piece is that in 2017, two local artists, Michele Bernardi and Arnold Holtznecht, added a new layer of art. They added an illuminated quote from the political philosopher and Holocaust survivor, Hannah Arendt, to go over it. So now, if you walk by this building at night, what you see are her words. And what she had to say was, Nessuno ha un diritto di obedire or no one has a right to obey. And that's in direct opposition to the original fascist dogma, which says credere, combatere, obedere, or believe, obey, fight. I think there's a sense in which all public artwork looks both backward and forward. Our cities are always going to contain some vestiges of who we used to be. But what we can do with a new layer of art is we can add something that shows who we aspire to be going forward. 
In the case of the Trolley Squares mural project, we chose color and joy over dirt and grime. We decided that the neighborhood should reflect the vitality of the people who live there. In a lot of ways, it was a very easy decision. But I don't know that the decisions are always so easy for cities. And so what I'd like to propose as a sort of guiding question for projects going forward is whose words, ideas, and imagery are we ready to see come forward into the light? And whose words, ideas, and imagery are we ready to see fade back into the shadows? And how do we do that in such a way that we can promote a sense of social wellness and aesthetic wellness for all the people who live in our communities? And here's my mural. And there are 17 more that you need to go see as well.